Columbia, floating city in the clouds. Impossible feat of video game fiction, but not for the reasons you might expect. Hello, Internet. Welcome to Game Theory. We're like Zoom and Games if you replaced big-breasted babes with big-brained bros. Speaking of brainy, Bioshock Infinite is one smart game. I mean, really, any game whose plot consists of more than shoot this corpse, or save this girl, or use this anthropomorphic glove to play with your balls deserves a good old tip of the cap. But Bioshock Infinite is in a league of its own, having enough glover fondled balls to tackle, of all things, quantum physics. In fact, it's their explanation for how the city of Columbia manages to float above the clouds. They, well at least she, invented the technology that allows the city to float. Giant balloons. Quantum particles, suspended in space-time at a fixed height. So, not giant balloons? All right, Bioshock, you talk a big game, but does your science hold up? Is your city in the clouds actually possible? Back in episode, what, 12 of this show? We found that the underwater city of Rapture was possible, so your track record's been good this far. But what would life really be like in Columbia? Would we want to live there? Let's find out. What was it Elizabeth said again? Quantum particles, suspended in space-time at a fixed height. So... Not giant balloons? Before we get to the science, Booker DeWitt's confusion about giant balloons is understandable. I mean, looking at the way the city is designed, you see blimp-sized balloons attached to practically every floating island. Some have propellers, and all of them actually have a gentle rise and fall that would suggest being ballooned and not pinned in the air like she says. So clearly the quantum physicist on Bioshock's research staff wasn't communicating all that well to the art team on that one, but in theory, the quantum particle explanation would work. Prepare to see the coolest video you'll watch all week. Wait, you're already watching the coolest video. The second coolest video you'll watch all week. So what's with this magical illusion? What we have here is an example of flux pinning, which all depends on deep penetration. Penetration by magnets. So a superconductor is a material that, when cooled below a certain critical temperature, is able to conduct electricity with zero energy loss. In other words, if I added some electric current into a superconducting wire and removed the power source, the electricity would continue to run through the wire forever. Which is awesome, unless you're a magnetic field. You see, the other property of superconductors is that they expel any magnetic fields going through them. This is called the Meissner effect. But some super conductors, like this one, are so thin that magnetic fields are able to penetrate them. They just do so in incredibly tiny amounts called flux tubes. For a disk this size, there are nearly 100 billion flux tubes, able to hold 70,000 times the conductor's weight. At such low temperatures, the flux tubes become pinned and can't move, which is how the disk levitates in space. Colleagues called my Lutes field quantum levitation, but in fact it was nothing of the sort. Magicians levitate. My atom simply failed to fall. She has a point. It's not just levitating, but locking. The superconductor can be locked into any angle by these flux tubes, which means Columbia could just as easily be an upside-down floating city as it is a right-side-up one. Looks like Dracula knew his quantum physics. Video games, teaching you basic quantum mechanics since, uh, 2013, I guess. So if we wanted to know what it would take to keep Columbia afloat, we would need multiple degrees in theoretical math and physics. I mean, look at these equations. I've said in the past that when you introduce Greek letters, you're doing some serious math. But when the entire equation is in Greek variables, well then, it's all Greek to me. 
Suffice it to say, Columbia is theoretically possible, but were it to really exist IRL, we would need enormous tracks of magnets on the ground and lots of liquid nitrogen to keep the floating disks cool. Which brings us to our other point. What would life in the clouds actually be like? Well, first we need to answer how high in the air Columbia is. To do that, I took pixel measurements and triangulated against Wario's grossly inaccurate height from the last ep- I'm <laughs> just kidding. For once, the game made it easy on me. Hallelujah. So, Columbia is somewhere between 15,000 feet and 20,000 feet in the air, or between 4.5 and 6 kilometers above sea level. At this altitude, things are going to get cold. The average air temperature is between 5 and negative 12 degrees Fahrenheit, or negative 15 to negative 24 degrees Celsius. So your baptism into the cult of sky racists would be taking place in a frozen pool. And all that beautiful landscaping? Yeah... No. Forget your jodhpurs and petticoats, you merry band of clansmen. You'd best be wearing parkas and snowshoes. But perhaps the more fundamental question, could you breathe? Well, it depends. At sea level, you have lots of air pressing down on you, but as you get higher, there's less and less pressure, meaning less dense air with fewer molecules for a given volume. At 6,000 meters above sea level, this translates to about 50% less oxygen in the air. If you were walking to this altitude, like, say, climbing up a mountain, your body would slowly acclimate to the thinner air over time. But our dear friend Booker DeWitt doesn't have the luxury of a slow ascent. In seconds, he's transported up thousands of feet, meaning his body doesn't have time to adjust to the new atmosphere. Booker's greatest enemy isn't a bird robot or a gun-toting revolutionary, it's lack of oxygen. Anything above 8,000 feet runs a high risk of altitude sickness. Hape, an excess of fluid in the lungs, and haste fluid in the brain. Upon stepping out of his rocket pod, Booker would feel shortness of breath. Within 10 minutes, he would be unconscious, and in another 20, he'd most likely be dead. Sorry, no Vita Chambers this time. So, assuming that we're given enough warm clothing and time to acclimate to the high altitude, could anyone actually live in Columbia long term? Well, it's important to get some perspective. Columbia is certainly high, but at 20,000 feet in the air, it's still 10,000 feet lower than the top of Mount Everest. And many adventurers like you have made it to the top of that mountain's summit, but actually live there. La Rinconada in the Andes is the highest permanent human settlement known, at 16,700 feet or 5,100 meters. And there's documentation that humans have survived living at 19,520 feet or or just under 6,000 meters for up to two years. So it seems like Colombia's right in that range. What helps is that people born in these high altitude societies tend to have adaptations to aid survival, enlarged lung capacity, greater stamina, lower rates of obesity. So over time, the population of Colombia would adapt to live there more comfortably. And the 15 to 20,000 feet where Colombia is locked is well below what's known as the death zone. That's the altitude at 26,000 feet feet or 8,000 meters, where there's not enough oxygen to sustain human life. In the end, it's not the physics of building a city in the air, the cold or the lower oxygen levels that makes Columbia an impossible place to live. It's air sickness. Seriously. People living in Columbia would constantly need a barf bag. Why? Motion sickness results from one of three causes. Motion that is felt but not seen, motion that is seen but not felt, and when both systems detect motion but they don't match up. In Colombia, you would constantly be faced with spatial disorientation. Whether it's the floating platforms freely moving around and under you as they're depicted in the game, or, if they're truly quantum locked in space, just the clouds flying past you giving the illusion of motion, your vestibular system, or balance system would constantly be fighting against your visual system, and without anything stable in your line of sight, there would be nothing to give you a firm sense of grounding, resulting in a constant state of nausea. In short, in a scenario so impossible to believe, it's the most mundane challenge that's the deal breaker. A city in the clouds kept afloat by microscopic magnet tubes and voodoo science? No problem! One that pushes the limits of high altitude adaptation? 
piece of cake, but being constantly subjected to the equivalent of car sickness? Nuh uh. And no amount of quantum physics can fix that. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. Welcome back to the Super, Super Amazing End Card Tournament. Tournament. Where last episode, Nintendo won in a landslide against Genesis. 40% to 10%. Probably didn't help that I had it at the end of a video about a Nintendo character. Admittedly, poorly controlled variables. Anyway, this week it's a Clash of the Titans. Which of the big three is your favorite? Superman, Spider-Man, or Batman? Click on one to vote, but before you do, consider subscribing to this channel, because, in all honesty, it'll help me reach one of my life goals. To get a million subs. And <laughs> I know that sounds like a lot, and I recognize I still have a long way to go. But unlike other channels that do it for fame and fortune, I just really want the sense of achievement. Knowing that I'm helping to educate and entertain hundreds of thousands of games with each episode is just incredibly rewarding. So help me spread the good word, loyal theorists, so that we can make the gaming community just a little bit better. All right, enough sappy stuff. Choose your character. And don't let the new Superman movie color your opinion either. I think I'd go with... 